legendary players of all time, Alabama. When you think about defensive players, you think of Rudolph Lowe, Derek Thomas, Terrence Cody, Rashid Johnson, John Hand, Leroy Jordan. But there's one linebacker that when you think about the hardest hitting mofos you ever seen on TV. You think about one guy. You think about Marvin Constant. Marvin, thank you for being in Carolyn's Treasure Shop. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Roll Tide. Roll Tide, man. Hey, man, when I when I looked you up, man, I said, man, he's going to be on my show. I was, I'm talking about acting like a little schoolgirl. <laughs> <laughs> anytime, anytime. I'm always available. Now, uh I didn't know this. We just discussed this two, uh, just a couple of minutes ago before I pressed the record button. Two weeks ago, I recorded, I recorded an interview with your cousin, Jermaine Funny Man Johnson. Yeah. Now, how, like, the small, and, and here's the kicker. A couple, two months ago, you, you and Jermaine did an interview, and he asked one of my questions. <laughs> I did not put two to two together, I swear to you, I was like, wow, small world. Yeah, and then, mom and my mom and sisters. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, that's a small world, because I mean, for me, when I started doing this show, Jermaine was like my, like, when I sat there with my social media consultant, Lou, which I'm going to give a shout out to, uh, I'm going to put his little business right here probably see it right if you're watching this now you see his little advertisement right here somewhere yeah right there bam anyway when i was talking about lou about doing this show he asked me who do i want to who do i want to interview and i said uh man is this a comedian that i've been following for three years he's been on the couch talking about he watches alabama football and uh I want to interview him. And Lou looked at me, but you probably want to start a little, you want to start slow. You know, <laughs> maybe interview some local people, maybe. I said, right. Okay. Second episode, second episode in. He, I went to his website, bam, he said yes. I was like, See? So, hey, you but never, this ain't Jermaine. Forget Jermaine. You know how it's going to happen. So, <laughs> yeah. You know, I, a lot of people are. I got to a lot of people are a lot more approachable than you actually think. Yeah. Yeah. He, the class that that man has is unbelievable. But I don't want to make – Jermaine had his time two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. I don't want to make this about Jermaine. I want to make this about <laughs> you. Let's start it off with what I, what I ask everybody. The first question always, where are you from? Tuscaloosa, Alabama, Central High School, the class of 1998. Roll Tide. Go Falcons. <laughs> <laughs> now, is it – I heard it through the grapevine that you actually, as a kid, you sold sodas at uh, the stadium. Was that Legion Field or Bryant Denny? Bryant Denny Stadium. Um, Central's coach who just retired, Dennis Connor. Dennis used to be over those concessions. Shout out to Coach Connor. And him and my uncle would always be out there. So they would always have us out there. Selling Cokes. So, yes, I sold Cokes in Bryant Denny as a kid growing up. <laughs> now, you brought up Central High School. Y'all won the 6 8 championship in 96. Tell me about that season because, I mean, that wasn't to this day, people in the state of Alabama, I don't follow high school sports. I don't want you to pretend like I don't want to pretend like I follow high school sports. I don't. You know, once you get to college level, that's when I pay attention to you. But People in the state of Alabama still remembers that 96 season with the 6A because our high school played in the 6A during that time. Uh, tell me about that season. Tell me about uh, – just tell me about playing for the state championship. Um, that season, it was – I'll say this. Most of the games that we actually played that year were far easier than our practices. So <laughs> – the only challenge that we had that season was when we played Robert E. Lee and we ended up winning that game 13-10 and they were like the number one team in the country and we ended up beating them. It was like week four or five. And then when we played Jeff Davis for the state championship, we ended up winning that game seven and six. Outside of those two games, everything else was pretty much a cakewalk. But when you look back 
at that team and you look at all the talent that was on that team across the board, how many guys went to Alabama off that team, it was ridiculous. So, I mean, you know, it was like you didn't have a choice but to win. But the thing about it, we were all neighborhood kids that just grew up together. You know, there was no recruiting, none of that. Nobody was calling people, hey, won't you come play with us? You know, we're just all neighborhood kids who just grew up together. Wow. I mean, so I guess y'all had like a brotherhood or, you know, just that yeah. type of – when y'all talk about being team players, y'all were all team players. I still talk to several of those guys – on a regular basis. And if you if you ever go to my Instagram, you'll see that I posted a lot of those pictures on my Instagram from that 95 season and from that 96 season, holding their state championship trophy with my high school coach, Buzz Busby, a lot of my other coaches and a lot of the guys who I played with. Uh, how many of those people call you for money? <laughs> nah, none of them call me for money. I can honestly say most of them are very successful, so. I, I, that's a lesson. Well, I'm going to tell you what. Uh, don't change your phone number because I'm going to be calling for 20 bucks next week. So uh, <laughs> I have to ask you, you know, I, 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 this is what intrigues me. What was the recruitment like coming out of high school? I mean, you definitely was – it was schools all over the country looking for you. So don't pretend like there was, like, only one school. Yeah. There, there were several schools looking for you. What was the recruitment like? Well, some funny stories. What do you, what was your memories? Um, recruiting, it was a fun process. And just the fact of, you know, a lot of kids, you know, they'll see, they'll get a scholarship offer from one school, two schools, three, four, five schools. And, and you know, they're on cloud now. You know, I think back to having over 50 scholarship offers from Penn State, Notre Dame, Michigan, Miami, almost every school in the SEC, Florida State, USC, UCLA. It was like everybody wanted me to come play at the school. So, you know, when you have people all over the country wanting you to come play, that, that's impressive because, again, most people only get recruited in their region. You know, very rarely will you see schools from the West Coast, from up north, from all over the country coming after you. Now, you talk about funny stories, you, you know. <laughs> so when somebody dined me out about Florida coaches coming to my house to come see me. <laughs> I got a phone call, you know, right after they left. You know, that, that wasn't a pleasant phone call from Dubos. He, he was not thrilled. I, I got my suspicions about who dined me out about those Florida coaches being at my house. But I'm going to keep that one to myself. <laughs> All right. If you ever need some help, let me know. All uh, right. We'll I, I'm going to hear the story. It's, some, it's a secondhand story. Uh, the first episode we ever did, we interviewed David Evans of Ole Miss. Mm -hmm. And he talked about how he he told me, you know, we, we worked together. So we we interacted, talked. And he told me a story a long time ago. And he told me that Mississippi, he played for Ole Miss. And he told me Mississippi State called him up, wanted to meet with him. And the recruiter came by and said, hey, uh, we'll offer you, we'll give you the same thing Ole Miss is giving you. And David, being kind of naive and everything, he looked at the guy. He was like, "Like what? A scholarship? Like what? What? What, what are you going?" Hey, hey, I just now the first time on the video, you can see he's kind of leaving some stuff out. But the first time he talked, he, he, he remember, I remember him telling me they kind of just stared at each other for like two minutes. Like he couldn't legally, he couldn't say what he wanted to say, and. Right. David didn't know what the heck he was talking about. Like, I, they're giving me a scholarship. What can you give? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, long story short, you know, he played for Ole Miss four years. You know, he, you know, that's the end of the story. But uh, Mike Dubos, tell me a little about him. I mean, what kind of coach was he? Dubos, he was a great coach, man. I, I actually enjoyed playing for Dubos. I didn't enjoy the three a days. The what? Three a days. Yeah, we had three a days. Yeah. So we were practicing. I never heard on three a days. We would practice in the morning, regular practice. We would have about an hour, hour and a half. We'd come out around lunchtime and we'd have a special teams practice. Then we'd break and then we'd come back that evening for a third practice. We did three a days. That was before the NCAA stepped in and said, hey, y'all are going to kill these kids if y'all don't stop. <laughs> 
I you know, that's, that's, that's no sympathy for these kids. Now, you know, it's two a days, one day, one day, you know, one practice the next. We did three a days every day. I mean, so we go to dinner and it was just sit there in Bryan Hall and you wait to see who's going to be the first one to catch a full body cramp and just fall out of the chair. <laughs> that kind of reminds me of some Junction Boys stuff. You heard about the Junction Boys. Yeah. Uh, I mean, did he give you water? We got water, but, you know, you can imagine how hot it is in Tuscaloosa during the summers. Doing three days in Tuscaloosa was not pleasant. I can't imagine I'm from Alabama. You know, it's hot. It's hot. So you're doing three a day and all that equipment. Oh, my God. It, it, is, it is torture. So you got recruited. Uh, Florida, Penn State, you had a bunch of recruitment. You went to Alabama, but something happened. You got red shorted. I mean, being that, you know, let's face the facts. You coming out of high school, you was, you was a beast. I think somebody, I think Lou told me, that you was are by the time you got out of high school, that you was already doing like five hundred pounds bench and like squats yeah. with like eight hundred, you know, some unbelievable number numbers. Like, and I'm looking at Lou, and I'm and I'm I'm like, he's eighteen years old. He can't be doing all that. And, and I, I can see him doing five hundred maybe, but yeah. you was squatting eight hundred pounds. Uh, I was getting close to seven hundred. And they red shirted you. Yeah. Who the excuse my language? Who the hell got in front of you? Because I don't I'm not interviewing him. Well, the guy who was in front of me was Travis Carroll. Oh. Uh, but the next year you see Travis end up transferring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he yeah, he ended up transferring that next year. Twenty years ago. Where did he go, where did he go to? Florida. So, but I'll tell you though, that year they redshirted me, man. I was pissed. Like I was like, "You really gonna redshirt me?" You know, I was like, "I have never not played behind anybody." You know, when when I was a kid, my mom had a fake birth certificate for me because I'm four years younger than my brother, so that I could play nine and ten football. You know, with them at the age of seven. <laughs> so. You know, and I started on that team at seven years old, you know, you know, with 10, what, 10, 11 year old kids. So, you know, I've never not played behind anybody. So I made it a point every day in practice to destroy everything that I could. Neil Calloway was the offensive coordinator. He would be so pissed at me. All you'd ever hear is repeat it. God damn it. Repeat. Run it again. I would literally destroy Everything that they try to do in practice every day. <laughs> yeah. And then Lance Taylor, Lance was the offensive GA. Lance would come talk to me. He's like, won't you just let them run the play? Just let them get it off. He's like, they're not going to yell at you. They're going to yell at me because they can't accomplish anything because none of them can block you. I was like, well, hell, they red shirt me. So what do you want me to do? You want me to come over here and let them kick my butt? Like, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> And that leads me to my next question, man. What was it like practicing against the likes of Andrew Zal, Tyler Rotz, Sean Alexander, Zander, the pop, arguably the best running back to ever come out of Alabama, Chris Samuels? What was it like playing against these guys at practice? <laughs> Again, I was blessed with a lot of gifts. So a lot of times when I'd be at practice, because just being honest, there weren't many people who could block me. So a lot of times you'd hear Dubos hollering, stay off of Sean, because I would be back there trying to knock him out. <laughs> oh, boy. So, yeah, I mean, it was a lot of days when they'd all be mad. Like, you know, can you just not disrupt everything? I mean, so, you know, Chris, oh, Chris, I got Chris too. One time, I hit Samuel so hard. When I tell you, he flew back up and fell straight back on his neck. I mean, it was ugly. Chris jumped up. Because, you know, normally it would be Callaway hollering repeat it. After that, Chris jumped up. Oh, hell no. Repeat it. Repeat it. <laughs> he wanted to run the play again. I'm like, hey, man, I've already did you. Yeah, why you want to repeat it now? <laughs> so, yeah. It, it uh -huh. was 
lot of torture at practice. <laughs> yeah, it was, and then he, they had to go through it three times a day. Man. Yeah. I mean, I, I can tell you some stories, but one, one of my good friends, Terry Jones Jr., you know, me and Terry played high school together and college together. <laughs> I caught Terry running a little dig route across, uh, across the field one day in practice. When I tell you, they didn't throw him the ball, but he started jogging. He started, you know, taking it off. I laid into him. When I tell you, I cleaned him up. I, I, all he was like, Boom! I laid him out. About three plays later, I just feel somebody just my whole left side just collapsed. I look up and it's him. I told y'all I was gonna get you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, it was a lot of fun going on back then. Uh, we're gonna fast forward a little bit. I'm sorry, I'm, you, you're a funny cat, you know that? Yeah, uh, what, what's your memories of Legion Field and Bryant Denny Stadium, man? Legion Field, we only played a few games in Legion Field. I, mean, I know uh, you played Vanderbilt because I was there, yeah. We uh, played um, I mean, Legion Field was cool. I was never – I always preferred playing in Bryant Denny more than Legion Field. You know, Bryant Denny always felt more like a home game. You know, going to Birmingham and playing in Legion Field, you know, being an older stadium and it was more spread out, you know, it wasn't as loud as, as Bryant Denny. You know, yeah. As a fan, it hurts your back for four hours sitting on those little steps. Jesus. I can imagine. <laughs> You're literally trying to put your back against somebody's knee so you can have some support. But go, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, I've, I always enjoyed playing in Brian Denny more than I did Legion Field. So, you know, and playing in Brian Denny, I mean, I have, I have a lot of fun playing in Brian Denny, you know. You know, some of the guys who we played against in that stadium, I mean, you're talking about great memories, you know, playing against Jamal Lewis, Travis Henry, all those guys. In Bryant Denny, Kevin Falk, you know, Cedric Wilson, oh, man, like, man, it was crazy the level of talent that we played against in that stadium. Right. Uh, and, you know, you're, is you, I haven't, last time I was in Tuscaloosa, I think it was, I was working in Tuscaloosa and I went by the stadium and I went to check out Bear Bryant Museum. Uh, is your picture still up around the stadium? Um, I got a few in Ramajama, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I, I remember seeing your picture, but, I mean, it's been years ago. Yeah, I, I, it used to be in the Bryant Museum. I don't know if it's still there or not. I hadn't been in the Bryant Museum in a while, so. Yeah. yeah. But And also, you know, speaking of, of guys that we played against in that stadium, you know, one of the guys, you know, we played against University of Florida, Rache Caldwell. Just, you know, shout out to him and his family, man. That hurt my heart this morning to see yeah. what happened. Actually, so, yeah. I, I was going to say, uh, you already mentioned him. I was going to ask you your input on that. I have it right here. Play, you know, playing against uh, players like Deuce McCaster and him and Jamal Lewis. Uh, what was your take? And let's go ahead. Let's forget about Deuce McCaster and Jamal Lewis for a second. Let's uh, let's talk about uh, let's talk about him. What was your memories of him playing against him? I mean, he was a great wide receiver, you know. So you know, you always had to respect him and those other guys, you know, on that Florida offense because you know they had Bo Carroll, John Capel, and a bunch of other guys. They were all just track guys, speed guys. So you know, every play when you lined up, you knew. If they was coming out in four or five wides, you better get ready, put your track shoes on, because you about to be running, you know. So, and it was just, I, I enjoyed watching those guys play, you know, especially on the Spurrier. They were masterful at the way they ran that spread offense. I mean, they were well beyond their time at the University of Florida at the time, you know, because, I mean, you look at what they did then versus what teams are doing now. You know, basically, that's what all teams are doing now. It's what the, the Gators were doing in the 90s. You know, it's, it's a little bit more advanced, but that's pretty much it. So, you, you know, it was fun watching those guys play. I mean, you looked at their defense, man. You had Javon Curse over there, um, Mike Peterson. I mean, they had a stacked team. But, you know, but but to hear that, you know, that's what happened to him, you know, 
two guys trying to rob him. You know, I mean, come on, man. You know, of all the ways, you know, somebody can can pass, you know, that's the last way you would expect, you know, for a guy like that to go, man. You know, it, it's sickening. It's like, why, you know, to even why do you even want to rob somebody? You know, let alone, okay, fine, you want to rob him, but you don't have to shoot him and kill him, you know? You, you took this man's life for what? You know, so that, that, that really hurt my heart this morning when I seen that. Because, you know, I was like, you know, that could have been one of the guys who I played with, you know, in the same boat. So, yeah. Uh, it, it just shows you how precious life is. And mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I like to say shout out, but I don't think this is a, a moment where I want to say shout out. I want to give my condolences to the family right. and the friends. Uh, also, wanna, I mean, this is somebody that you met on the field. This is somebody you met in public, I assume. Right. Uh, or acquaintances, am I correct? No, we, I just played against him a few times. Well, you know, anytime two people share that same bond playing against right. each other, you know, uh, my condolences to you. Uh, Y'all both were warriors. What made him so – when you played against him and you saw him in the NFL and, you know, what made him so good? I mean, he, he was quick, you know. He, he was good getting in and out of his breaks as a wide receiver. You know, that's one of the things that if a wide receiver is good at getting in and out of his break and he can add quickness to it, it just gives him another dynamic. I mean, very rarely will you see a receiver who who's going to have solid breaks and he's quick in and out of the breaks because most guys, either he's going to be a fast guy, he's going to run go routes down the field. If a guy's getting in and out of his breaks, well, usually you'll see that guy lined up in the slot you know, he's running the slants, he's running the quick stuff, stuff like that. You know, very rarely do you see a receiver that can do both. You know, it's almost like that same thing with Jerry Judy. Jerry Judy can do both. You know, it's not every day that you can see a receiver who can get in and out of his breaks and has speed. That is a rare combination. You know, so when you get guys who can do that, you know, that's what separates them from the rest. Well, let's, uh, let's move on to Deuce McCaster and Jamar Lewis. Uh, these are two legendary SEC players that you played against. Uh, what's your memories of you know putting? What's your memories of putting their uh, putting their putting your hands on them? Well, I mean, I had double figures in tackles against both of them. So, you know, for me, I enjoyed playing more against Jamal Lewis and Travis Henry because you know both of those guys went in the first round. So. You I was Henry. He played in uh, geez, Louise. I need to get more research. Travis, who did, did he play? He played for Tennessee, didn't he? He played for Tennessee. Him and Jamal Lewis were rotating every two plays. Both of them went in the first round. Yes, yes, I yeah. remember. Uh -oh. It took me. A, I had to. I had to like put my memory cap on. Yeah, they both played for Tennessee. Yeah, those guys. Um, fresh in the fourth quarter man those and you know they still running just as hard in the fourth quarter as they were in the first quarter it was like man i'm ready for this to be over but um i enjoyed playing against those guys because you knew what you were gonna get you knew it was gonna be a physical game physical matchup you know man on man best of the best so you know you knew that it was gonna be a long one you know it wasn't gonna be anything cute anything flashy it wasn't nothing fancy it was like okay let's line up let's play big boy football and may the best man win I mean, that's pretty much what it was. You know, with Ole Miss, Deuce McAllister, they were a little bit more, you know, try to be a little bit more fancy with him, you know. It was fun playing against Deuce. You know, I put a nice few licks on him. But for me, I love playing against Travis Henry and Jamal Lewis because, again, you knew that was going to be big boy football that day, and there was no way around it. Before we get to the legendary LSU game, uh, I had to ask you, same thing I asked your cousin. I know hate is a strong word. Right. So let's use this. What do we dislike about Auburn? <clears throat> like that nagging little brother who just follows you around everywhere, who wants to be as good as you. But with, you know, 1957 and 2010, you know, you have this many championships you know, versus our full trophy case. You know, it's like you keep saying you're just as good as us, but you don't have the body of work to support it. You know, it's like, ah, uh, you oh. won championships, but you're not on our level. Uh, Mr. Constant, I'm sorry. To, this, just, this, came, just, this just came in. Hold on. I'm reading. Auburn just won the national championship in high-and-go-seek. 
<laughs> oh, it says it right here. You know where they found them? They right. found it in the interpreter room because nobody goes in there. <laughs> oh, congrats, congratulations to Auburn. Good job. <laughs> I mean, I'm, proud, I'm happy for them. I mean, come on, you got. I know you're. I know you're an Alabama fan, but we, we can give a shout out. Congratulations to Auburn's high and go seek team. I can't do it. Huh? I can't do it. Not even to the high and go seek team. Can't do what? it. <laughs> to the high and go seek team. Good job. The, the trophy room. You, damn. You're right. Nobody goes in there. Yeah. But with, uh, the, uh, Mr. Constant, you're the man. Let me go ahead. Let's move on to the LSU game. Now, this game is legendary. The good thing, the cool thing about this game is you had, I don't know how many tackles you had. You had at least like 12. 13. I mean, so what? 13, what, four or five tackles for loss. Yeah, it was, it was a pretty, I was, I was doing some work that day. Yeah, you, you was in the MVP, most definitely. Uh, they probably gave it to Tyler Watts, but I, I don't know. I don't remember. I I was going to watch it, and then I had stuff to do. Like, <laughs> I was going to lead up to it. I was just going based on memory because your name got called out a lot during that game. Right. Uh, I forgot the, run, the quarterback's name, Josh Booty, I think. Yeah, Am I correct? Josh Booty? Mm-hmm. Okay, as I recall, it was they, they they you missed the field goal, and yeah, they ran y'all. I mean, they ran the ball down the field, and their second they didn't have no timeouts. They ran the ball down the field, and then all of a sudden, Josh Booty snaps the ball. He he goes to the sidelines. He runs to the sideline for some reason. I don't know why he didn't throw it. Maybe it was an option. I can't remember the play. Your your fellas in what you what was going through your head, but they go to the sideline. Somebody grabs him, and then you hit him and then falls. And then the game is over. Everybody's cheering. Mike Dubas is on the field, and but you're not getting it up. Now, you won the, you won the game. First thing I want to know, what was going through your mind at that particular time during that play? And, you know, just you was there, I wasn't. Tell, tell us what happened. Well, I seen him rolling out to the left, so I just assumed that he was going to throw it because the tight end had released. So I just, you know, I assumed, but then as he's moving more and more to the left, I'm realizing, okay, he's not going to throw this ball. He's about to run it. So I got to make a move. So as I make my move, I go over, and he jumps. And when he jumped, I jumped. I came down on my left leg with my weight, his weight, Reggie Miles' weight, Cornelius Griffin weight all on my one leg. Mm. Yeah. And I had actually, I actually, I talked to Josh about a year ago. And he was like, yeah, man, coach told me to just run the ball. He told me just fake the pass and just run it. He said it was run all the way. We were never going to throw the ball. I said, you son of a. <laughs> so, yeah. Did I get his name right? Yeah, Josh Booty. Yeah. It's so you're looking at 50 years of SEC football. It's kind of hard. Right. 50. It's hard to uh, remember every single player. Right. Uh, you know, uh, I do watch other sports. So, shouts out to Josh Booty. Yeah. O O T Y. Yeah, Josh is a good dude. So. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and you know, congratulations to the LSU national champ. I was actually pulling for Oklahoma, but. Uh, it is. I only support one team. I, I no, whoa, 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 whoa. I support only one team too. I got three teams in sports. I got Alabama, I got the Atlanta Falcons, and I got the Chicago Bulls. That's my three teams. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't cheer for nobody else. However, Alabama was out of the playoffs. I was keeping up with Jana Hurts. After this season, I'm right. not watching the Oklahoma game ever again. Enough said. Right. I cheer for one team and one team only, too. Yeah. I just. No, I, 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 let me retract that statement. I will also support Clemson if they're not playing Alabama. I, I don't support. I mean, that's on you. Well, <laughs> that's because a lot of my friends are there. 
You know, you got a lot of guys who played at Alabama. There. You got Todd Bates there. You got, you know, Dabo, he was a receiver coach when I was at Alabama. Paul Hogan, the assistant strength coach, he played offensive line. He was one of those guys that I was torturing in practice. I, I got you. I understand. Oh, we, we actually, we actually, I, it's a couple people that from my hometown that played for Clemson. Uh, but if I'm not mistaken, and for the life of me, I forgot the kid's name. He's the best wide receiver in Clemson football right now. What's his name? Uh, you talking about Ross? Justin Ross? Or Justin he- Ross. He's from hometown. He, I, if I'm not mistaken, somebody I went to school with is his mom. I could be wrong. I had to do my research. Mm. So, you know, with Justin Ross being from my hometown, Ooh. you want him to do good. But yeah. when they play, but when they're playing Alabama, that's his ass. That's just right. the way it is. Right. You know, I yeah. hope his mom's not watching because then it'll be my ass. But <laughs> but let's move on. So uh, so you stopped Josh Booty. You're on the ground. What was going through your mind? I, I just didn't want to be touched at that point because I was in extreme pain. You know, I mean, you tear everything in your knee. It's not a good feeling. You know. And then when I seen my kneecap was missing, I knew I was in a bad situation. So, you know, I, I honestly, I just told the trainers and the doctors, you know, just let me lay here. You know, I don't, don't, you don't have to move me. Just let me lay here, man. I mean, that's a pain that I wouldn't wish. Yeah. So did they take you to Birmingham? No, Tuscaloosa. Oh, okay. So what was the verdict? <sighs> Let's just say I, ultimately ended up in Birmingham having everything redone. <laughs> right. Um, so you did later Dr. on Dr. Kane, best doctor on the planet. <laughs> later <laughs> later on that season, uh 99, we I say we like I suited up. You gotta you gotta forgive me. Uh but we as the fan base and the team Y'all go on to win the 1999 SEC SEC championship. What's your memories of winning that game? Oh, man. You know, that game for me was bittersweet. You know, we won the game, but because I didn't get to play, you know, that was not something that I really enjoyed as much, you know, as the rest of the guys did, you know. But still, you know, the fact of knowing that I contributed – you know, to us winning that championship throughout the season. You know, I have some satisfaction in that, but at the end of the day, not being able to play in that game definitely made me feel some kind of way. But, you know, what can you do? You can't, you can't, you can't, you know, you can't win them all. So, you know, sometimes you, know, you got to take some L's, I guess. I thought maybe you was going to break the ring out. Oh, <laughs> I needed a charger. Oh, I was I was getting happy. I was like, he's gonna break the ring. He's gonna we're gonna see the ring. We're gonna see the ring. And no, that thing's in a box somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we leave Alabama. Uh, you pay from ninety eight uh, ninety eight to two thousand. You. <laughs> Very professional, right? Yeah. Sorry about that. So, oh, right. so we leave Alabama. You did a little stint in arena football. What was that like? It was fun. You know, I I enjoyed it. You know, it was it was definitely different. <laughs> For me, the biggest thing was I wanted to to play and just show people that I was back healthy. So. And ultimately, you know, I did. I met a lot of great guys along the way. And from actually, you know, playing arena, the Dolphins actually seen I was healthy. They brought me in for a little tryout. You know, it didn't go as, you know, well as I would have liked it to. But, you know, the fact that, you know, to go from people saying that I'd never run again to even playing arena, to even have the Dolphins to bring me in, you know, it was, for me, that was a major accomplishment, you know. Because I, I know what it would have been had I not ever gotten hurt. 
So, but you know, when people tell you you'll never run again and all this other stuff, and you know, to 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 do what I did after all that still means a lot to me. So, now for me personally, dealing with something like this, uh, reason why I have so much respect for you is something that a lot of people don't think about. They are battle with depression and. You know, I, I'm somebody who suffers from anxiety attacks. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm sort of ashamed to admit that because, you know, as a man, you don't, you know, right. it's kind of a touchy subject. Uh, but you, de- you came out and you was like, look, man, I, I, I had depression. And you're looking at you now, you know, seeing the type of man you are now, you look like you're 20 something. Uh, you got a smile on your face every five seconds. And, you know, I'm glad to see that. I'm, at least I hope that that time has passed, but would you be willing to talk about some of the things that you went on, that you went through to maybe help somebody else down the line? Uh, maybe somebody, the 10 to 15 people watching this, cause it's not, we don't got a big viewing audience. Uh, well, I'll say this, man, you know, for me, the, the biggest issue that I had, that I would say stirred the pot more than anything else was when you have to watch your teammates play and all these other guys play that not trying to be funny saying this, but watching them play. And when you know, you're so much better than all of them. No, you're not being funny. We, so, we've seen you play. So it's like, it's, it's, it was hurtful to the point of them. I can't go do the thing that I've done my whole life. The thing that I always knew that I would do, until I was 35, 40 years old, you know, and to have it just snatched away, you know, like that, you know, that's what bothered me more than anything else, you know, and having to go over there to the facility and watch these games and not being able to play, it, it took an emotional toll on me because at the end of the day, again, I always knew that that's what I was going to do because for me, playing football was easy. You know, for me, I always loved to work out. You know, I always loved to play football, you know, where a lot of guys study film and do a lot of other stuff. I watched film, but I didn't watch that much film. You know, I just had the natural instincts, you know, and and the abilities to just go out there and just do it, you know, with like no effort. You know, it was just so easy for me. And to have it taken away, yeah, that did something to me. So, you know... And it took some years to get over it, you know, because nobody's just going to get over something without doing anything. So for me, it was like, okay, you got to find something else in life that's going to motivate you. You got to find something else that's going to make you happy. How do you incorporate some of the things in the past that make you happy moving forward into new things that will give you that same level of joy? that you received from playing football. So, you know, it was just, you know, finding that thing that would bring you back to your happy place. And where was your happy place? (laughs) Well, for me, it was when I started teaching, you know, I actually enjoyed helping kids, you know, and a lot of the kids, you know, they would listen to me and they would rather come spend time with me than other teachers. Whoa, 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 whoa. They didn't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> well, not even that. I mean, just like t- to this day, I still have issues with my students not wanting to leave my class. Like, you have to go to your other classes. You can't just stay in my room all day and just hang out, you know? I get it. You love my class, but you got to go. <laughs> Hell, they're probably scared to move. No, we actually we actually have a lot of fun, I'm man. I'm joking. I know who you are. (laughs) Yeah, like, so I I, I teach high school engineering. Um, You know, we actually, was that, two years ago, we won first place in the nation for electrical applications. Last year, we won first place in the state for robot design. You know, so we've won a lot of major competitions. You know, I tell tell my robotics team, like, listen, I hate losing. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. I hate losing (laughs) I, I know how you feel. Uh, I, I started coaching my son's soccer team. And 
I thought I was a little Nick Saban. You're seeing me, you know, these are, these are, you know, I used to laugh my ass off about these kids coming over here, you know, these coaches and parents, these are fight, but man, that, that competitiveness comes in. I was trying to make them run three days. <laughs> so look, I'll tell you a funny story about coach, right? <laughs> so I used to work his football camps. That was back in 2009, 2010, right? So, have you ever been to one of his football camps? So, he holds no. these camps. He holds two for high school kids, and he has another one from, for 7 to 12 year old, 7 to 12, 7 to 13, something like little kids, right? So, most of these kids, you know, the, the bags that you run through, most yeah. of these kids are not even tall enough to get through these bags. I mean, they're out there with helmets on, and coach is yelling at them, and he's talking to them like he talks to the team. I mean, he's cursing them out. You know, he's dropping F-bombs, GD. I mean, he's going in. He's So at the end of one of the days of camp, the camp director comes out. And he's like, all right, guys, we're getting a lot of complaints from the parents. They're complaining because y'all out here using profanity. Y'all are talking to these kids any kind of way. We all look at him like, hey, man, you know who that is talking to them kids like that. That's coach, not us. You ain't going to go tell him that, but you're going to tell us that. He's the one talking to the kids like that. I mean, he was out there giving it to those kids. <laughs> the director comes over there talking. The parents are complaining. Uh, their complaints need to be directed to coach, not us. <laughs> oh, man. That, that's... Yeah. Well, on that note, uh, we got to talk about, man, the book, Un Unraveling of a Man Who Bleeds Crimson. Uh, in this book, you talk about your depression a little bit. Uh, you talk about playing in Alabama. You you talk about a lot of things. Uh, what gave you the influence to write this book? That was part of me finding something to help me get over my depression. You know, just, you know, I just wanted to write to get it out. You know, I felt like maybe, you know, it will help somebody else in the future. You know, you never know who would pick up the book and find some type of inspiration in, it, in their own personal journey. So, you know, it was just my way of, of giving back. And, you know, hopefully, you know, somebody will pick it up and it would inspire them. Well, we know what you're doing now. You're teaching. Uh, I was joking a little bit, but I know they like to have fun in your class and everything. But if they ever see game film of you, I promise you, they'll listen. <laughs> they, they've seen it. They they like to Google me for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> they want to know who they. Excuse me. They want to know who you mess. Who they messing with? Yeah, like, you, gotta, you know, I was a high school kid at one time too. Uh, you know, I used to <laughs> test my teachers, you know, and you know, it, there was teachers that you tested, and there was teachers that you did not test. Right. It, 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 just the way it is. But uh, uh, congratulations on your teaching career. Uh, I got some quick questions for you, real fast. Uh, All-time favorite Alabama player. Ooh, that's a trick question. <laughs> I'm all-time favorite. I got to go with my roommate, Freddie Millings. I used to love watching Freddie play, man, just to see how he would move with that ball. I mean, that quickness and just I loved watching Freddie play, man. So shout-out to my old roommate. <laughs> uh, all-time favorite Alabama moment. Ooh. In history? Yeah, you can go back to the 20s if you want to. I don't care. Favorite all-time moment. Um, if I had to say favorite all-time moment, it would probably be Marcel Darius in that 2009 National Championship game against Texas when he ended up with that ball and he still forms uh, that quarterback. I don't even remember who was it. Was it Applewhite or Colt McCoy? I don't even remember which one it was. But when he stiffed on them to the dirt, <laughs> I was like, yeah, now that is the true definition of Alabama football. My, my, my wife can tell you this story. Uh, I, I was talk, talking about your cousin again, Jermaine. Uh, we was talking about favorite all-time moment, and I said the catch. And I, I remember to this day, my my fiance and me were out of town during the Tennessee Alabama game in mm -hmm. 2000 and was it 2000? Yeah. 2009. Uh, 
and the field goal block from Terrence Cody. I remember because we haven't had a national championship to, since 1992. Right. And I was telling my fiance at the time that I need a national championship. You don't know, understand how important this is to me. And I right. remember being on my knees in the hotel room. I didn't even see the block. I was on my knees praying. And I, I could just imagine my Kim told me later that she was just looking at me like I was retarded. But uh, I just I was on my knees praying something miracle would happen. And boom, Terrence Cody. Mm, I missed. I had, to, I had to watch the replay. Just get yeah. one up. That's all you need. <laughs> months later, we win the national championship, and I've never been the same since. Uh, quick question. Uh, last question. And I know you have to go. Uh, Do you feel any remorse about the trees in Auburn? Unfortunately, it was a sad situation, but no remorse. <laughs> <laughs> no remorse at all. Now, I get sick of seeing them rolling them stupid trees anyway. My God, they should have paved over where the trees were. Marvin, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I know this is so unprofessional. I, I apologize. I'm trying to, I'm trying to be professional. I really am. Uh, yeah. Shouts out to the trees. No. Anyway, uh, you know, I'm gonna want some Auburn players to be on here, and they're gonna, they're gonna all say no. You know, I just I, life happens. <laughs> I just have to stick with Marvin Constant. Motherfucker. Anyway, anything you want to plug? Uh, I know you're writing a new book. Uh, anything that you got coming up in the near future? The only thing I got coming up is this book, which I plan on finishing by the end of the summer. Um, title, hadn't quite decided yet. I think I'm going toward physical and mental fitness at 40 plus. You know, I just want to you know, let people know that even in your 40s, you know, you can still, yeah, you can still. Yeah. Yo, hey, yeah, you, know, you can got a time and D. <laughs> yeah, you'll be, you know, in, in the best shape of your life in your forties. You know, it's just a matter of eating right and applying yourself. And I understand, you know, life's a lot more busy now, but you still have to make time for that because if you're not healthy, you know, the time that you're going to spend, you know, being sick and out of commission, all these other things, you know, it's, it's counterproductive. You know, so for me to maximize myself on a daily basis, you know, I believe in staying physically and mentally fit. Yeah. Well, it was an honor. I never in the wildest my wildest dreams think that I'll ever be sitting down talking to Marvin Constant. You are a legend. Thank you. You're Thank you. And I the, I'm humbly saying this. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. Uh stay on the line. I'm gonna press stop. Check uh to everybody watching, you know, stay tuned, Careless Treasure Shop. You know, this ain't it. We got more legends coming. Thank you, Mr. Constant. Damn. Here at Carolyn's Treasures, you can design your own belt. I'll be with my favorite team. Roll Tide! We don't like Auburn around here, but if you do, we will make you one of our Auburn Championship belts. Ooh, yeah, this is heavy. <laughs> Yeah.